This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin. In this edition of the Onkis in Brief, I'm talking with Vince McCruz and Dr. Margot Shoup. Dr. Shoup is a national recognized surgical oncologist who specializes in gastrointestinal cancers and sarcomas. She is also the senior vice president and system chair of Nuvens Health Cancer Institute, where she provides strategic and clinical leadership for all aspects of Nuvens Health's cancer services. Vince McCruz is a patient of Dr. Shoup. In March 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was ramping up in the northeastern United States, Vince was diagnosed with a rare abdominal cancer that develops in the lining of the abdominal wall and the soft tissues that surround the kidneys, pancreas, and blood vessels. Vince needed surgery to remove the tumor. But removing this kind of cancer requires one of the most complex types of surgery. And while a diagnosis of cancer alone can be daunting, what if the cancer is rare and you're diagnosed during a pandemic? In this edition of the Youngest in Brave, we talk about that experience with Vince McCruz, a father of three and grandfather of four, who has experienced several health and personal challenges over the past several years. In 2013, he was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, and in 2019, he underwent major colon surgery, which required a three-week hospital stay. In 2018, he also lost his wife, Cynthia, to complications from Parkinson's disease. And then, in March 2020, during a routine CT scan to follow up on the colon surgery, doctors discovered a mass in Vince's abdomen. Biopsy results confirmed that the mass was malignant. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Youngest in Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal, Oncuzine, at www.oncuzine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. For more information on how to support a program, also visit our website ongozine.com. Now, let's listen to the interview with Vince McCruz and Dr. Marco Schub. Welcome to the Ongozin Brief. Thank you very much. Vince, can I, if I start with you, how are you feeling today? Very well, thank you. It's been a little over two months since my surgery, and I'm feeling increasingly good. That is very good news. Before you were uh, diagnosed, what kind of uh, symptoms did you experience, and what prompted you to think, well, something is not uh, right? I was diagnosed in March of this year, 2020, and leading up to that, I really had no symptoms until very late in 2019 or very early in 2020. And the only prominent symptom I had was uh, significant fatigue to the point that almost any amount of physical exertion would cause me to have to lie down and, and rest, if not take a nap. That's the only symptom I really felt. I didn't know what was going wrong with me, but I knew that something was wrong. Was that something that you felt, okay, well, this is now really important. I, I need to consult a doctor. Yes. It got to the point where it was impeding my daily life. When it began, I figured, well, this is just something that's going to pass. Again, of course, I had the cancer at the time, but I didn't know it. Uh, it did not pass. It went on for a couple of months, and I happened to have already scheduled a CT scan to examine the progress from previous gastrointestinal surgery I'd had in July of 2019. So I figured, well, I'll go in for that scan, and then I'll, as necessary, open up discussion with um, my doctor or doctors to see what this new fatigue condition is all about. And that surgery you had in 2019 was unrelated to a cancer, or it was not related to cancer? That is correct. I had a severe case of um, ulcerative colitis. Now, Dr. Shoup, when you hear this story, um, how common is that uh, for, or for, for patients to be concerned about their condition, feeling tired, but not immediately make the link with cancer? Oh, it's, it's very common because if you think about it, a lot of us have those kinds of symptoms where we'll feel a little tired, maybe feel a little bit of acid reflux. You know, um, most people don't 
going off to their doctor with that. And with the kind of cancer that Vincent is ultimately having is sort of a, a hidden cancer because pretty much you don't have any symptoms from this until people actually do exactly what he did. They get to the point where they say something's just not right because it's not getting better, but there's nothing specific to lay your hand on that, that actually something is very wrong. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you look at that aspect, are, are you prepared to, to, to teach or to tell patients? What is your approach there? Pretty much just sit down with people. You don't want anybody to feel bad that they didn't get attention sooner because most people wouldn't. And it's not the first thing you're thinking about when you have these kinds of symptoms. And so it really just depends on what the ultimate finding is going to be after they actually get this worked up and diagnosed. For the most part, we look at the overall patient, what kind of symptoms they're having. And for someone like Vince, it was very obvious what the issue was when he had his CAT scan, that he had this, this huge abdominal tumor growing inside of him that was taking up almost the entire abdomen mm -hmm. that was causing his symptoms. And it's, it's very interesting that he didn't have any other symptoms, but I think that in retrospect, I think he may agree that there may have been some that he just didn't realize were attributed to the tumor rather than the fatigue. And so the next step is to get this taken care of. We can't go backwards. We can only go forwards. Let's get this taken care of and, and get you feeling better. Now, Vince, I mean, after the diagnosis, you are in uh, the, the office with a doctor and you've been told... Well, you have cancer. You've been diagnosed with cancer. What was your initial response? How did you feel about what, what, what went through your head? Uh, to be honest with you, my very first reaction was that I had just gotten a death sentence. I did not know very much at all about cancer. I lost my mother to cancer uh, 24 years ago and then two good friends in, in, uh, in previous years both to pancreatic cancer, and I, I didn't have a knowledge base about what cancer meant and what recovery could be, and so I, I just thought I had been told I was going to be dying. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my immediate reaction. It was not until I began my interaction with Dr. Shoup and began to get more educated about the type of cancer that I had and about even the fact that there are many different types of cancer and that they're not all alike, that I began to feel you know, somewhat more positive, at least to begin feeling that I wasn't necessarily going to, to die because of this cancer. Right. Now, in retrospect, I mean, you were there in the office. Before you were diagnosed and before the, you, you were told you have cancer, there was absolutely nothing that really would alert you to say, well, something in that in, in, in indication may be possible? Not cancer. I, I just knew, as I said before, I knew that something was not right. I thought that, well, I just went through significant gastrointestinal mm -hmm. surgery a few months before, so perhaps there is something that is not right in terms of that recovery. I, I really had no clue at all about cancer. That was far from my mind. Right. It didn't even enter my mind. Now, Dr. Shoup, I mean, when you hear that, right, I mean, uh, you have a patient that comes in, may have a medical history, has no inkling about the fact that there, there may be a link with cancer. How do you prepare yourself for, for telling a patient that he or she has cancer? And how can you, what are some of the things that you, you, you do to make sure that the patient doesn't really shut off in terms of, I hear you, but I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm listening, but I cannot really understand what you're saying. Yeah, that is a really good question because, you know, normally when I see people as a surgical oncologist, they've already had a diagnosis of cancer when they come to me. And so it's not frequent that I'm giving the diagnosis for the first time, but it's certainly not unheard of. And you're exactly right. When, when you tell somebody and they're hearing for the first time that they have cancer, you almost feel like you might as well just stop talking after that because, um, and, and Vince, you can tell me if this is what you felt, but it's hard to have anything else register because you're so focused on that word cancer. It's almost like I think about the Charlie Brown, you know, the wah, 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 wah. I might as well just stop talking because they're not going to hear me. So it's always, always when you know you're going to be telling somebody that for the first time, it's so important that they have somebody with their family with them. Or during the COVID crisis, you at least have somebody on the phone to be able to have two sets of ears, at least they're listening to what's going on because a whole host of questions are going to come up afterwards. And so very typically we say, you know, let's, let's talk about this again at another time and, and we'll address what has to be done. And so when, when Vince came to me, he already had a diagnosis of cancer. He'd already had the 
the a shock sink in. And I think was more in the mindset of, okay, what can I do now to take care of this rather than the shock that I have cancer. And, and that's when we have to move forward and say, okay, this is what you got. This is what we have to do. This is what we're going to do. And I always tell people, I can't guarantee I'm going to cure you of this. I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee you, I'm going to do everything in my power mm-hmm. to cure you of it. If, if you want to move in that direction. Right. Let's take a break. And then we're back with our interview with Vince McCruz and Dr. Margot Shoup. Dr. Shoup is a national recognized surgical oncologist who specializes in gastrointestinal cancers and sarcomas. She is also the senior vice president and system chair of the Nuvens Health Cancer Institute. Vince McCruz is a patient of Dr. Shoup, who was diagnosed with a rare abdominal cancer requiring surgery to remove it, all at the same time that the COVID 19 pandemic started ramping up. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Jonkers in Brief. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is encouraging cancer patients and survivors to be extra cautious during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cancer treatment, especially chemotherapy, weakens the immune system, making you at higher risk of severe illness. Dr. Lisa Richardson is director of the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. Take these steps to stay healthy. Wash your hands often with soap and water. Clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces daily. Stay home. If you must leave, keep at least six feet between you and others. Avoid touching your face, eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. If your temperature is 100.4 or higher, call your doctor. Use CDC's coronavirus self-checker to help you make decisions about seeking medical care. Make sure your caregivers and household members are aware of your higher risk and take precautions. Visit cdc.gov backslash coronavirus and preventcancerinfections.org for more health tips. This is the Oncazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. Now, you mentioned COVID, and I can only imagine that uh, for you as a healthcare provider, but also for patients that are actually are going to visit uh, a clinic or going to visit their doctor, a lot of things have changed. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, well, no, the course of COVID has changed just uh, tremendously, and we're luckily in Connecticut doing all the right things for COVID. So we're seeing a little bit of a swing back to some sense of normalcy, although not quite in the medical profession. But we became, we made rapid improvements and rapid changes very quickly across the system, as most healthcare systems did, to be sure that we were offering the safest care possible. And one of the things that we did for cancer surgery specifically is that we had to really evaluate every single patient that was being considered for cancer surgery to be absolutely sure that the risks didn't outweigh the benefits because we had you know, a real need to make sure we protected our supplies uh, for, for um, taking care of patients. And at the same time, we don't want somebody to sit around with cancer and not have surgery if it's something that is really going to make a difference immediately. So we had to actually make some very tough decisions at the system level Well, we had cancer surgeons all across the system, 25 to 30 surgeons twice a week, discuss every patient that we had that had cancer that we would, we think should have surgery and had to decide. It's very painful. We had to decide which patients should go ahead and get their surgery during this era of COVID and which ones can wait or have another form of therapy first instead of surgery. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, some patients could get chemotherapy first or radiation first or sometimes some other forms of immunotherapy first. For sarcoma, like what Vince had, there really were no other options. The surgery really is the only option at this point. And so it was sort of a no-brainer for our group when we discussed him to go ahead and do surgery. But we've made a lot of changes. We've had to separate our teams um, so that we have two different teams that are taking care of patients at any one time. So if one group got, got infected with COVID, the whole team, everybody didn't go down. Although luckily we didn't have that happen. We instituted some really extensive disinfecting and techniques and no visitors were allowed very quickly. I, when I met Vince the first time, he could have a visitor with him, but I, that was it. After that, I have he's been seeing me by himself and even with surgery, he had to be by himself. We just couldn't risk having anybody come into the hospital to visit patients 
who could potentially be bringing a virus in with them. And so that just wasn't safe for everybody else. So ultimately, hospitals have become incredibly safe place for care. And I think that a lot of people don't understand that. They're scared to go to a hospital, but also they have to understand that it's their people in the hospital are very diligent, very protected. Hand washing happens all the time. And it, the few people now in Connecticut that are admitted with COVID are in a separate unit altogether. And so you're actually probably safer being in a hospital than you are being in a grocery store, to tell you the truth. <laughs> well, that, so that's where we've come. I think that is, if you're a patient, that is definitely good news. I'm not so sure if it, people that actually do their weekly grocery shopping, uh, if they really appreciate it that much. But anyway, it's it's a good thing mm-hmm. to see that you, as, as as part of a hospital a network, a nonprofit net, net, network, that you do everything in your power to make sure uh, to consider patients and, and also consider the fact that they are uh, safe and be taken care of. Now, let me switch back to Vince real quick. Vince, of course, you are being diagnosed with this particular disease. We're going to talk a little bit later about what that all is and, and what follow-up was required. But now it's COVID. You are, again, you're diagnosed. What went through you knowing that this is a time of COVID? I mean, what kind of considerations? Uh, what, what, yeah, what, what, what were you thinking? It's a good question. I certainly, of course, was aware of COVID, but I was so focused on the news of having cancer that my concerns about getting the cancer addressed just sort of wiped away the concerns I had about, uh, about COVID. Uh, I was far, far more concerned about the cancer than I was about covid of course, as things developed, COVID became a more clearly serious issue all across the country. But at the time of, uh, of my initial discussions with Dr. Shoup, COVID was just starting to, um, to raise its head. I had um, originally thought of going to Sloan Kettering Institute in New York City for my treatment, just simply because I knew of their reputation. In fact, one of one of my two friends who died from cancer was treated there. And so um, I knew of them by reputation. The more I looked into it, however, uh, the more I became aware that COVID was rapidly becoming a serious issue, particularly in New York City at the time. And so I, while I was most concerned with cancer, I also began to think, well, gee, maybe it's not the best thing that I could do to be in New York City being treated for this. And uh, it was just very fortunate for me that Dr. Shoup reached out to me at that time because I was I was investigating Sloan Kettering. I had a discussion with one of their doctors. They could not guarantee getting me into uh, Sloan Kettering very rapidly. When I had the discussion with them, it was going to be at least two or three weeks, and even that was not guaranteed. And all the while, the New York City COVID picture was getting worse and worse by the day. So Dr. Shoup uh, arrived on the scene and, and I was incredibly impressed with her and how focused she was already and knowledgeable of my case. And we had not even, before the first meeting, ever spoken or, or met in any way. So at that point in time, I became much more concerned with getting in ASAP and being treated by Dr. Shoup. So uh, when you, um, you had concerns about COVID, but I mean, if I understand right, I mean, it was more important for you to make sure that your cancer was being treated. Yes, the cancer was the far greater priority than COVID was at the time. Now, go back to the time that that you were being diagnosed. How did your children, your family respond to 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 the fact that you were diagnosed, and and how did they become a, a potential support for you? They were, to state the obvious, they were very concerned. I would say, especially my two daughters. I have a son and two daughters. They're all adult children. They're all out on their own, married and lives of their own. But they were very concerned about me, particularly in the context of having just lost their mother, my wife, uh, in November of 2018. Mm -hmm. So I think the immediate reaction, especially of my two daughters, was we've just lost our mom. Now it looks like we may lose our dad. Very emotional. My son was was more steady about it. Uh, He's my oldest and uh, is also a doctor, so he's used to seeing serious medical issues and and treating them. But they they quickly reacted in a more positive vein. They didn't spend a lot of time and energy on 
worrying and, and stressing about it, they quickly got into the mode of, well, it's all going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Dad, we're going to fight this, we're going to succeed, and, and we're going to be there with you through, throughout all of it. So uh, they, they quickly formed up as, as a key part of my support. And of course, that was important for you. Now, let me switch back to Dr. Shoup. When you look at COVID, uh, you look at a, a, a cancer patient, uh, newly diagnosed, and you look at the potential for family support. How important is that family support in, uh, in the normal circumstances to help the patient, but potentially also help the, the, the physician team to, to, to help the patient in that respect? So basically, uh, part of the collective. How important is the family of patients in that case? Oh, it's incredibly important. As a matter of fact, you know, Vince is, I think, very fortunate to have a strong support system with him, with his family. And and not everybody is that fortunate, but it makes a, a tremendous difference to have people there to, you know, come with you to your, to your doctor's offices, to their visits. I actually encourage patients' families to stay with them while they're in the hospital because I think it's very helpful to have a family member around as as you know, people come through the room and tell the patient what's going on. It, again, another set of ears, somebody else to be your advocate during the whole time of your care and as you're considering care. It's just tremendous. And then not to mention going home after surgery, you know, people are not back to normal right away. It takes weeks to get there and you have to have somebody who can really help you get better without pampering you too much. We don't want people to go home and, and be treated with kid gloves. They have to get up and move around and get strong. But it's so important to have a strong family support. It's very challenging to us um, when we take care of patients who don't have that because we need to get them the same kind of care as everybody else. But sometimes trying to figure out how to get them um, the kind of support that they need involves bringing in our social workers and other people to really to really support them. And it's just so nice when they have a family around, family members that can do that for them. It's incredibly important. Now, COVID is, the, is here. This COVID change this approach or what kind of impact, um, in fact, you mentioned earlier that um, Vince came by himself. There was no family allowed or no people allowed around him in that respect. How how does that impact and how does that change your role and, and the role of the physician team under these conditions? So I did, um, the very first meeting I had with him, um, he did have, I think his daughter was with him, if I'm not mistaken, in the, during the follow-up times and, and during surgery itself and, and during the recovery part from surgery while he was still in the hospital, uh, we were not allowed to have any family members come in then. So we really did everything we could to communicate with the family as much as possible. Uh, like he said, his son is a physician and I spoke to his son frequently mm-hmm. before surgery and after surgery because he has the best uh, idea of how to translate the knowledge that I'm telling about what's happening to the rest of the family members since he's a physician in the family, which is always really helppful to have somebody who's in medicine in the family right. and have that. But, you know, it's it's frustrating because it's nice to be able to go in and see a patient and sit down and hold their hand and talk to family members about what's going on. It, and it just, the, the COVID situation really took some of that ability away because we really tried not to, we really tried not to touch patients any more than we had to. Of course, certainly we have to examine people, don't get me wrong, but the social distancing was a real factor at that time. And so we had to be very careful about that. We only had one person in the room at a time to see him. We didn't come in with a whole group of people. We have a whole team of people in the hospital to help take care of a patient, but we can't all be in the room at the same time. We're really trying to limit the interactions. So it really did change the way we take care of patients, but we certainly, the the care was not compromised in any way, shape, or form. We still followed all the same kinds of things that we normally do as far as getting them out of bed and moving and and interacting with the family as much as we could. We just had to do it by phone calls rather than in person. Right. And and of course, that's that's the biggest change. And and I like it that you say that the actual care did not change. Um, The fact that you were able to, to provide that care, even under potentially more difficult situations. Let's take a break. And then we're back with Vince McCruz and Dr. Margot Shoup. Sarcoma. Odds are you've never heard that word before. But for the 40 people diagnosed with sarcoma every day, it is a life-changing word. Life-changing and devastating because sarcoma is cancer. Sarcoma is a cancer of bone and soft tissue more prevalent in children than in adults. More than 6,000 people lose their lives to sarcoma each year. Treatment options for sarcoma are limited, and new therapies are desperately needed. 
More research and increased awareness is necessary to find a cure for a cancer that you probably didn't even know existed until now. Through awareness, advocacy, and research, the Sarcoma Foundation of America is determined to help those affected by this forgotten cancer, to bring hope to the children and adults whose lives are forever changed by a word they had never heard before. Please help us in the fight to find the cure for sarcoma. For more information on sarcoma and the work of the Sarcoma Foundation of America, please go to curesarcoma.org. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin. If you're just joining us, this week we talk with Vince McCruz and Dr. Margot Shoup. Dr. Shoup is a national recognized surgical oncologist who specializes in gastrointestinal cancers and sarcomas. She is also the senior vice president and system chair of the Nuvens Health Cancer Institute. Vince McCruz is a patient of Dr. Shoup, who was diagnosed with a rare abdominal cancer requiring surgery to remove it, all at the same time that the COVID-19 pandemic started ramping up. Now let's let's talk a little bit about the the kind of cancer and about the the diagnostic. Uh, in, 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 the fact is that this is a rare form of cancer he was diagnosed with. It is. Um, it's a, it's called a retroperitoneal sarcoma. Sarcomas can uh, be located in several different places in your body. His was in the abdomen, and that's why we call it a retroperitoneal. It's just a fancy word of, mm-hmm. way of saying sort of in the abdomen. It's a rare form of cancer, but it's not unheard of. And it's very important that, you know, you, you, the treatment is taken place by people who actually specialize in this because it's not uncommon for a physician to go their entire career and never see this type of sarcoma. I was very fortunate before joining New Vance Health. I had back in my training trained at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where we saw a lot of these. And so sarcoma has become one of my areas of specialty, which is the reason why he ended up with me in the first place is because there's not a lot of people, not a lot of surgeons around that are comfortable doing this type of surgery. One of the frustrating things about rare cancers is that we just don't have as many treatment options available because we don't have as many clinical trials available because of not enough patients to go into these clinical trials. And so we um, really, the sarcomas right now, for the most part, and like sometimes there's some other situations that may warrant giving radiation up front, but for the most part, we treat with surgery up front to remove the entire tumor it's rare because it develops really just from the surrounding soft tissue, some of the fatty areas and some of the muscular areas within the abdomen. It's not coming from a specific organ per se. It's not coming from your colon or from your stomach or from your lung. It's just coming from the surrounding tissues, which is what makes it a, a rare tumor. And there's all kinds of different types of sarcoma that um, are all treated a little bit differently. And he had really the most common subtype, which is called a liposarcoma which means it really is coming from uh, the surrounding fatty tissues more than anything else. And again, this is a very difficult to, or a rare disease. Um, if you look at, at and compare it for other forms of cancer, how many people in the United States may get this disease uh, if you compare it for other forms of, of, of cancer, from breast cancer to prostate cancer to other forms of cancer? If you compare that, I mean, what does it mean in terms of numbers? It's only about 1% of all cancers. So that's how rare it is. It's uh, very uncommon. So again, you're, you're, you're specialized in sarcomas. You see the patient. How do you explain to, to a patient what this disease may be and how it might impact them in, on the long run? Yeah, so this, this type of cancer is, because it's rare, we, we don't actually, like I said, we don't actually offer typically chemotherapy or radiation along with the tumor resection. Instead, we do surgery up front and remove the entire cancer, which is very important that we get all of it, which is mm-hmm. why it requires such an extensive surgery because the tumor tends to be stuck to some of the surrounding organs, and we try not to remove any more organs than we have to with this. Uh, sometimes it's stuck to some major blood vessels, and we have to really carefully dissect it off the, the blood vessels. In Vince's case, it was also stuck to his tumor and his adrenal gland, and so we had to remove those as well, which is not uncommon for this type of surgery. And so now that the tumor is completely removed, we have to really closely monitor him to make sure it doesn't come back because they can. There are sneaky types of cancers that they can show up again at any time. And so he's getting very frequent follow-up CAT scans, which he'll continue to get for the rest of his life. 
as we continue to keep an eye on them, but just to make sure they don't come back. And, and the fact that this whole process takes place, it's, it's based on the fact that it's a very complex disease that you explained, right? Now, you mentioned about Spencer's surgery. What, what, what happened during his surgery? Surgery was about four hours. Um, we removed, the tumor was over 20 inches in size. That was one of them. There was two others. One was about eight inches and one was about five inches in size. And we had, to, like I said, we had to remove his, um, one of his kidneys and adrenal gland because they were in, involved with tumor as well. And so that was necessary to get the entire cancer out. Um, and then it just required very careful uh, removal of this off some very important other organs that we didn't end up having to remove, which is very important. We were able to preserve the major vessels, um, the, the aorta and the vena cava, the two, much, two most major vessels mm-hmm. in your body that this was resting right on top of. And we had to dissect it off of that. Also his colon and it wasn't, uh, we were able to move it away from his spleen and other organs as well. And so that's what makes it a four-hour surgery is the fact that we had to be very careful to remove the entire op- the entire tumor and not to damage the tumor at the time. We don't want to get into it, spill it anywhere. We want to move it all in one, all in one piece and preserve as many of the surrounding organs as possible. Right. But he did great with surgery. He surgery was very smooth, was very uneventful. He did not have to go to the intensive care unit after the surgery. He went to what we call as our step down unit, dead, and he uh, really he did great from the operation itself. But again, it's a major surgery. I mean, there's a lot of things that go that could go wrong. I mean, in this case, fortunately, it didn't go wrong. But it is important oh, to sorry. Yeah. <laughs> lots could go wrong. <laughs> it's, it's 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 definitely very. I mean, obviously, it's a very very risky and very uh, complex piece of surgery, uh, which involves a lot of different aspects. In, in of course, now then comes recovery. How do you do you help a patient to go through this? So we actually get him up out of bed as quickly as possible. Even the night of surgery, I believe he was sitting up into a chair and then get him up walking around, trying to get him stronger right away because he was unable to really get himself very strong going into surgery because of the burden of the tumor was taking so much right. of his energy. So we had to get him a lot stronger after surgery and we were able to do that. He was up walking. Um, we get him a breathing machine to work on. We give him blood thinners and he's on for about a month just to make sure he doesn't get blood clots. And luckily, um, he re- recovered so nicely that he was actually able to leave the hospital, I think, in about four days, if I'm not. Is that correct? Was it four days during the hospital? I surgery on Monday, and I left on Friday afternoon. Mm. So we call that four days, you know, each day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that, which is great. I mean, because I think the quicker people can get out of the hospital, the quicker they're going to recover, because it's just easier to lay around in bed when you're in the hospital than when you're at home. Um, and, and we actually follow him up very very closely on many occasions and did lots of phone calls. I think we had a couple of telehealth visits actually, rather than having him come in, I was able to talk to him with a uh, FaceTime a few times after surgery, just to see how he's doing and make sure he's on the right road for recovery. So now, now go back to Finn's real quick. I mean, you are after surgery. Tell me a little bit about your recovery. I mean, we've heard Dr. Shoup's kind of story, but tell me a little bit about your experience. Yeah, so I got out of the hospital after a very short period of time, and I felt, after the surgery, I felt good, but I was incredibly weak. It was amazing to me how much weaker I had gotten after the surgery. Walking was very difficult. There was some localized pain with the incision, but no other pain, no internal pain, but it was just very hard to get around. I remember getting into uh, my daughter's car when she came to get me from the hospital, and it was extremely hard to get into the car and then out of the car when she brought me home. Mm -hmm. But I I wanted to be on my own. I wanted to move as much as possible. So uh, although I was prescribed a walker, uh, I did not use that prescription. I did not get a walker because I wanted to walk on on my own, and I was just very slow in walking, but I did walk on my own, including when my daughter brought me home that afternoon from the car into the house and all the, all the way through the house. So it was, um, it was for a while, very debilitating, uh, a lot of trouble getting around. Dr. Shoup mentioned before the advantages of having family support. And, and I don't know what I would have done without my daughter to help me. She was able to take some time off work and spend two full weeks with me in my house. So basically, uh, she moved into my house, took care of me for two solid weeks, and and that helped a great deal. She helped me 
with basic things like getting out of bed in the morning, getting me into bed at night, helping me sit in a chair, get out of a chair. Uh, she helped with food preparation and, and so forth. But I, I think my, my recovery was going very well, but it, it was still, frankly, uh, difficult. Um, and, and the assistance made a, a huge difference. Now, Dr. Hugh, when you hear Vince's story, how common is, is, is what he describes as, as, as weakness, as things going slow? Um, how common is that for patients after surgery, especially with this kind of surgery? Very common. Uh, very, very common. I, we tell people that don't count on feeling well again for about four to six weeks. I mean, it really takes that long to start feeling like you can get going again and, and get doing, taking care of yourself again. I personally don't let people go home to be alone after this surgery. I think it's unsafe. And so we made sure that he had somebody that was going to be with him when he went home because you just cannot go home and be living alone after a major operation like this. And so when patients don't have family around to help them, then we have to figure out another place for them to go to a rehab center, or, you know, sometimes even to a nursing home. They, you just cannot go home and be home alone. As I think this, Vince can testify, he just would not have made it if he had done that. It would have been too challenging. But it does, it takes, this is very typical. These are big operations. And just because surgery is over, it doesn't mean you're home and you're back on your feet and back to normal again. It's another four to six weeks of recovery at home. Let's take a break. And then we're back with Vince McCruz and Dr. Margot Shoup. Each day, researchers make discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Their progress is made possible with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofflin, and this is the Alcazine Brief. But now we are way after the recovery process. Vince, how are you feeling today? I feel really good. I, I mean, there's no comparison between how I feel now and how I felt before the surgery. I, I feel energetic, both physically and, and mentally. I don't have my entire strength back yet. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do as much. I can't move as quickly before the surgery, but it, it, it's coming along. It's just going to take a while to get, get back to my, uh, quote, normal self uh, again. And uh, I'm satisfied with the progress. Dr. Shoup, you seem to be satisfied with the progress, but um, I feel r really good. I, I, uh, I actually feel very energized in life now. Um, in terms of the physical recovery, both from the surgery that I had in July of 2019, which was unrelated to this cancer, and this new cancer surgery, I feel that, that I'm recovering very, very nicely. So physically doing better all the time. I, I would tell you parenthetically, that, that I still have a lot of emotional recovery relative to losing my wife mm -hmm. less than two years ago. Right. But uh, that, that kind of got a little bit sidetracked because of all the health problems I've had. But I, I think life is, is getting better uh, every day. Uh, I am incredibly thankful for Dr. Shoup and the work that she did. And um, I, I hope that this thing is gone for good. But uh, we have mechanisms in place to, uh, to check my progress. And, and I'm sorry to hear about your wife. And I, I really hope that with your family members, um, you can muster up the strength to also heal in that way, uh, little bit by little bit. Thank you. Dr. Shoup, when you look at Vince's case, how normal, abnormal, how common is, is, is a patient like Vince? It's a good question because everybody's a little bit different. And you no, know, luckily, he was in such good shape going into surgery, maybe not the few months going in, he was pretty beat up, but in general, he's in very good shape, which really is a, a testament to the fact that he was able to recover so well. It really, we tell people, I, I, I tell my patients as they're getting prepared for surgery, 
that it's almost like you have to prepare yourself for like you're running a marathon. You mm-hmm. have to be in the try and be in the best shape that you can be. Don't lay around, try and do everything you can because the better shape you are going in, the, the easier the recovery is going to be coming out because everyone's weaker after surgery. So you want to be as strong as possible going into it. So um, it's not uncommon for people to have the kind of recovery that he had uh, because he's in such good shape going in, but it's also not unheard of for people that just take much longer to recover as well because they're, you know, coming in much weaker to start with. I've had other patients who have gone through very similar surgeries to what he went through that when they came in to see me, they were literally in a wheelchair. They were so miserable. They couldn't even walk. And as you can imagine, that's harder to recover from in the long run than someone who can come in and say, Hey, I was feeling great three months ago. I'm not sure what's going on now. Mm -hmm. So um, luckily we have come a long way in the last couple of decades with our ability to take care of patients with these kinds of large tumors and these extensive surgeries. And I have to tell you the fact that he we didn't even have to go to an intensive care unit is it you know just goes to show you that we have come along with our technology with anesthesia and interoperative our tech our techniques have really improved immensely and so it's not that uncommon to have somebody who goes home after a major operation like this and is feeling great a couple months later that's what we strive to do that that is our ultimate goal and so it's it's wonderful to see him like this now that is indeed a uh, testament and tantamount to the fact that you guys be able to help uh, patients in in this way. That is absolutely fantastic to to hear. But if you if you now also hear about, for example, about his, his psychological um, um, coping and 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 also the other things that basically started off or were involved in this, how, how uh, psychosocial support in 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 cancer and the cancer treatment uh, is is very important in in not in many cases in all cases. How can you help patients or how can your team help patients like Vince in, in also in coping in that respect, in, in becoming heal, healed again? Well, we have a really great team. I know I ride the shoulders of a lot of people that work with me. It sounds like I'm getting all the credit and I really shouldn't be because not only have a medical oncologist that is helping us to follow him, but we have a really good group of, we have social workers, we have dietitians. I have a fabulous nurse who has been keeping up close tabs on him all along, Victoria. We have a medical assistant that works with us. So it's a whole team of people that are there for him for whatever his needs could be. If he needed a genetic counselor at New Vance Health, we have genetic counselors as well. So it's it's a lot bigger team than just me. It's just I sort of am the quarterback of the team that helps make things happen. And we have so many people that he can reach out to or that we can reach out to him to help him get through any kind of other issues that he may have. Mm-hmm. And, and and even under COVID, uh, with COVID, Teams that that you be able to successful uh, help patients, manage patients, get them get them out of the hospital um, as soon as possible, get them healed. Um, that's obviously a, a very good point. And and now looking towards uh, the future, uh, Vince, uh, from from your perspective, a bright future, well, relatively bright future. It definitely is bright. Uh, I, I tend by my nature to concentrate more on the positive than the negative, and there is a lot more positive in my case to focus on than there is the negative. The big negative, of course, is that I have cancer and it may return. I hope that it doesn't, but it could. Um, But it it really is, I think, so far, a very positive story. And and frankly, my life is a positive story despite the, you know, the losses and setbacks. So uh, I feel good about living. I want to continue living. I have a lot to live for. And um, yes, to to net it out, it is a positive story as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well, on, on that positive note, thank you, Vince. Thank you, Dr. Shoup, uh, for uh, joining me this morning with uh, the Angus in Brief. I wish both of you well. Well, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure talking to you, and it's always a pleasure talking to you, Vince, as well. Certainly, same here, doctor. Okay, thanks very much. In today's edition of the Onkers in Brief, I spoke with Vince McCruz and Dr. Margot Schoep. In March 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was ramping up in the northeastern United States, Vince McCruz was diagnosed with a rare abdominal cancer that develops in the lining of the abdominal wall and the soft tissues that surround the kidney, pancreas, and blood vessels. Vince needed surgery to remove the tumor. And in this episode, we spoke about the care he received to meet his urgent medical needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. One thing that stands out is that Vince wants to encourage everyone diagnosed with an urgent medical need to talk to their doctors 
and not to put off medical care due to COVID-19 concerns. His experience is that healthcare professionals like Dr. Shoup and her team at Nuvens Health are more than capable of dealing with health concerns during a pandemic. Some evidence suggests that people, including patients with urgent medical needs, may be afraid to leave their homes in order to seek needed medical treatment. And while this is understandable, this may also result in the actual medical need getting more urgent and the illness getting worse. So, Finns has a clear opinion, stating that people should weigh the benefits and risk of possible COVID-19 exposure versus getting the care they need. Above all, he wants people to listen to science and not to have the decisions based on fear when it comes to managing their health. For more information about the Nuvens Health Cancer Institute, visit the organization's website at www.nuvenshealth.org. For us here at the Oncogene Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via PRX Public Radio Exchange and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And you can also download our program via podcast and streaming media, including iTunes and Spotify. For more information about supporting the Oncogene Brief, go to Oncogene at www.oncogene.com. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all. And thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofland, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine-related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.